Good morning, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to me to present to you Roberto Maiolino. He is a, a director of the Cable Institute for Cosmology at Cambridge and also professor of experimental astrophysics. Before Cambridge, he was uh, an astronomer at, at the Observatory of Rome and the Archetti Observatory in Florence. He's also a the, um, member of the science team of the nearest spec uh, instrument in the um, Web, uh, James Webb Space Telescope and project scientist of the Moon's uh, spectrograph in the VLT. Also project scientist of the high res uh, spectrograph for the extremely large telescope. And uh, at, in 2018, he was named a member of the Order of the Star of Italy. He's now a Cavaliere. <laughs> So thank you very much, Roberto, for, uh, for coming to, to talk to us. And uh, go ahead, I, I, leave, I leave you with me. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I hope uh, I can give you some uh, um, uh, an overview of uh, my area of research and some recent results. Let me try to share my presentation. All right, so uh, I will uh, uh, essentially the, the presentation. Ah, oh, sorry, let me start in uh, presentation mode. So the presentation is essentially divided in two main parts and essentially understanding uh, the uh, what uh, uh, is the mechanism responsible for quenching star formation in like galaxies and, prim and primarily identifying what is the role of uh, black hole accretion. And uh, the second part will be the opposite, which is uh, uh, see, uh, uh, understand how actually um, this, the same kind of processes can actually boost the star formation in, in, in galaxies and actually uh, have a positive effect. There. Now, um, this is uh, um, a, a well, uh, widely used diagram in uh, Astrogalactic uh, astrophysics, uh, where essentially the distribution of star formation, star formation rate, and uh, stellar mass in galaxies. This is from the Sloan survey in the local universe. And we know that most galaxies follow the so called, uh, improperly called, the main sequence of star formation, that is, uh, is where most of the star forming uh, uh, late type galaxies are located. And uh, uh, while uh, um, there is a, bi a clear bimodality in the galaxy distribution, especially high masses, where essentially the, the number of galaxies are instead uh, passive and uh, with very little star formation and, and uh, very little gas content. So, and the so called red passive uh, uh, quiescent uh, population of galaxies. So, the main, uh, one of the main problems that we have is. is to understand why at some point star forming galaxies stop forming stars and move towards the, the um, quiescent uh, region, which is the so called quenching process of star formation of galaxies. Uh, now, this is a, a cartoon illustrating the various possible mechanisms which can suppress and quench star formation in, in, in galaxies. It's very simplified, but it gives you an idea of the diversity of the processes. Um, so you can have these uh, the possible causes of uh, quenching, that is uh, environmental effects, uh, the presence of the star wars and the supernovae and so on, uh, black hole accretion and the uh, effect of the mass of the system. While these are the mechanisms where uh, you can uh, suppress formation by removing gas, therefore uh, removing the fuel, which is available for subformation, they suppress the efficiency of uh, star formation. So you have gas, but uh, you make it less effective in forming stars. And uh, uh, starvation, that is, uh, um, you prevent accretion of fresh gas into the galaxy. So the, ga the galaxy uses the available gas for forming stars and at some point runs out of gas and therefore dies because of starvation. So all of these mechanisms are uh, and causes are in place in probably in most galaxies in different classes of galaxies. And uh, uh, the, the question is to identify which is the primary uh, mechanism, OK? And to give you an, an example of the diversity of quenching, this is a famous diagram in which you have the um, 
uh, halo mass of galaxies. And here you have the scalar to halo mass ratio as a function of halo mass. That is, you see that uh, at high masses, uh, you have uh, this efficiency of uh, star formation has been very low. And uh, at low masses, is is well is being low, and you have a sort of a peak uh, in efficiency around uh, the ten to the twelve uh, solar mass and halo mass. And typically, these uh, uh, drop in efficiency is as, uh, associated with uh, star formation feedback. Uh, while at high masses, you have uh, in uh, your the, the models expect the, the, that uh, the quenching is dominated by AGN or, uh, or quasar feedback, that is black hole accretion. And you will see that these uh, scenario is probably too simplistic, at least, at least in terms of quenching. Uh, sorry. Uh, so um, back to this uh, uh, diagram, let's first start to identify what is the primary uh, cause. And I will show that black hole accretion is probably the dominant effect. Indeed, uh, to investigate uh, these, we have used the special results spectroscopy from uh, about 10,000 galaxies in the manga surveys, uh, the fourth uh, uh, edition of the Sloan uh, survey, where you have essentially integral field spectroscopy, three dimensional spectroscopy for about uh, several thousand uh, galaxies. And here you see a few examples of uh, uh, the footprint of the integral field unit. And this is the distribution of light in uh, a few galaxies that have been observed in the manga out of these several thousand. And what you can uh, essentially do, you can investigate the galactic properties in a, a special resolved way. So here is the similar diagram that you had seen earlier, where instead of stellar mass and star formation rate, you have surface density of stellar mass and surface density of star formation rate. And similarly, you have a sort of a special resolved main sequence here, and you have a special resolved quiescent uh, population of, uh, in this case, our galactic regions. And you see that uh, you can have a diversity of uh, um, kind of distribution of uh, star formation rate. Here in, in blue and red, you see the, the, the offset with respect to the, um, the, the this, uh, this line, this dividing line here. So here you have a galaxy which is uh, mostly star forming everywhere. Here is a galaxy which is quenched in the center and star forming in the outer disks. Here is the galaxy which is uh, star forming in the center and uh, quenched and uh, passive also, uh, everywhere else. And here is uh, the galaxy which is mostly uh, quenched everywhere. So you can investigate now the how, whether the re galactic region is uh, quenched or star forming as a function of several galactic properties. Okay, with this large statistic, you can investigate several potential uh, uh, effects which are responsible for quenching a region in the galaxy. And uh, to make a, a long uh, story short, uh, uh, among test testing various possible uh, galactic properties, the galactic properties which seems to be uh, dominant in quenching a, a galactic region is the black hole mass as measured from the central velocity dispersion, which we know correlate tightly with the black hole mass. You see this in this diagram where this you have the same diagram that I had shown here, but now color oops sorry, but now color coded by black hole mass. Okay, and you see that there is a very tight uh, bimodality in black hole mass uh, uh, is a function of uh, um, offset uh, the, the distribution between the star forming uh, main sequence and the quenched uh, population. The quenched population it seems there is nearly a one to one correlation. Of course, you may say that okay, but black hole mass correlates with a lot of other galactic properties. So how can you really disentangle? these various dependencies and uh, identify that uh, black hole mass is really the, um, the primary uh, uh, responsible mechanism. Well, with this kind of statistics, you can actually investigate this. For instance, in this diagram, you have the fraction of quenched uh, galaxies as a function of black hole mass and uh, uh, stellar mass. And you see that at a fixed black hole mass, the quenched fraction depends very little on stellar mass, but the fixed stellar mass, it depends very strongly on the black hole mass. Similarly, when you investigate the halo mass, you have that the, the quenched fraction depends 
very little on hell mass and uh, strongly on black hole mass, okay? And you can investigate this for all other galactic properties when you have this kind of, uh, uh, you try to disentangle these various specs, you have to uh, in, investigate these in multiple dimensions if you want, and you need some aid in terms of sort of machine learning. And if you do that, you end up with this kind of uh, diagram, which is a machine learning uh, identification of what is the relative importance of the various uh, galactic parameters in quenching a galactic region. And these are called coded by uh, global parameters, local parameters, and environmental parameters. And as you see again, the central of dispersion, which is again a tracer of black hole mass, is by far the most important parameter in regulating, in the additive, predicting that a, a galactic region is actually quenched and unquenched. And the other parameters such as black hole, uh, stellar mass or halo mass or barge mass or uh, environmental effects are all essentially much less important, okay? So essentially out of all of these, uh, um, uh, I should, sorry, I shall mention that uh, this is true only for uh, galaxies which are central in the environment or uh, high mass satellites. It does, is not the case for low mass satellites where environmental effects can is actually an important the dominant effect, but I don't have time to discuss these other population of galaxies. Now, so uh, at least for uh, central galaxies and uh, high mass uh, satellite galaxies, out of all of these uh, uh, causes, uh, the black hole is the is the ruler, the king or the queen, depending on what is the gender of the black hole. I don't know, and uh, um, so I we can uh, therefore focus on this aspect and uh, identify now through which mechanism a black hole accretion is quenching uh, star formation in galaxies. And you have, as we mentioned, three possible. Mechanism. One of these is gas removal, that is the so called ejecting move, that is, you remove uh, uh, gas out of the galaxy because of quasar driven winds, and therefore you quench very quickly star formation. So let's investigate this, uh, um, um, this mode, that is, uh, this is a case of a galactic outflow, it's not actually driven by AGN, but the star formation. If you investigate, uh, there have been now several studies associated uh, investigating AGN or quasi-driven outflows in galaxies. And uh, there, these are very complex. Uh, AGN-driven outflows are multi-scale, multi-phase, and multi-epoch. I just uh, provide you examples of uh, these uh, um, molecular uh, nuclear outflows on very small scales in a nearby uh, AGN. These other uh, outflow in the ionized phase, uh, at uh, on the kiloparsec scales at redshifts around two. And this is another case of a very um, uh, strong uh, cold outflow traced by the C2 line in uh, um, tracing the atomic gas on scales of tens of uh, kiloparsec in the uh, close to the realization epochs. Now, I don't have time to illustrate the various properties of agent debit outflows, but they would require a complete uh, uh, additional presentation. The main goal is to identify whether this is an effective mode for uh, removing gas in galaxy and quenching galaxies. Now, the main um, mechanisms that uh, is being identified to uh, quench star formation galaxies associated with this objective mode is uh, essentially the um, a process in which you have a nuclear uh, quasar driven wind, very fast wind with uh, velocities close to relativistic. These impact the circumnuclear region, and the evolution, the subsequent evolution of the uh, expanding uh, shell depends on the behavior of the uh, this expanded shock gas. If uh, it uh, um, radiates the energy very quickly, then it essentially expands uh, very little, and in this case, uh, the energy, most of the energy is lost, and is, in this case, the, uh, it's called momentum driven, that is, uh, uh, only momentum is transferred to the uh, surrounding medium. In the case that instead the uh, relative losses are much uh, longer than the expansion time scales, then in this case, uh, you have a sort of bomb shell which expands adiabatically, 
And in this case, uh, it can be much more dramatic for the uh, interstellar medium uh, ISM of the, of the galaxy. You have that the, 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 the dramatic expanding shell can expand on much larger scales and uh, impact uh, the, the bulk of the host galaxy. And in this case, you have also momentum boost. The momentum rate, uh, initial momentum of the, of the wind is boosted by a factor of a few tens, okay? And uh, this is uh, where you may expect the um, molecular and uh, also large scale in as outflow to develop. Now, people have tried to investigate whether which of these two scenarios uh, applies for quasar driven outflows. In this case, very little, uh, not damaging, uh, much damaging. In this case, very damaging for the host galaxy. And uh, there's been several of these studies. This is one of them, for instance, which has tried to investigate the momentum rate of the outflow with respect to the momentum rate of the ultra fast outflows in, the, in this nuclear region. So, this is what I call the, the momentum boost. So in the case of momentum driven, you expect this ratio to be essentially one, that is you have conservation of momentum. While in the case of the energy driven outflows, you expect these uh, orange uh, points. And you see that actually for a large number of uh, galaxies, uh, of AGNs, the uh, outflow seems to be uh, mostly momentum driven, although there are some which seems to be energy driven, but it seems that for many, it's not actually um, has uh, uh, matching the expectation of uh, a major uh, dramatic outflow that is predicted by these, these energy driven models. Um, the other question is even if you, you manage to drive these uh, um, large scale outflows, does this gas escape the galaxy? And actually, in most cases, we see that, especially at high masses, the velocity of the outflow doesn't uh, exceed the escape velocity. So, so the, the, even if it, the, in the presence of an agent, the galaxy, the gas remount, remains bound to the uh, to the host galaxy, and uh, this has been now shown in various, various studies. Again, especially at high masses, and even the fraction of the gas that is uh, unbound is uh, um, actually uh, unlikely to escape the halo. So it may escape the galaxy, but at some point it will remain the halo and probably rain back onto the galaxy. So it's not really that these alpha are very effective in. The, uh, in quenching because it will anyhow uh, at some point rain back onto the galaxy to fuel additional star formation, okay? And uh, you may say, okay, but these are lo mostly local studies, therefore you may, you should look at uh, more distant uh, quasars where the, the outflows are much more powerful. And indeed, if we, there's been various studies at high rate shift where the quasars are seen to have uh, uh, very powerful outflows, typically uh, identified through the ionized uh, nebular lines, so especially of oxygen tree. And but uh, what is seen is that uh, there are indeed these powerful outflows traced by this very blue shifted oxygen tree uh, line. But if you look at the star formation rate uh, traced by the H alpha component in the host galaxy, this is actually mostly unaffected. There is a suppre local suppression of star formation associated with the outflow. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the star formation in the galaxy continues going on. So it's not uh, actually, again, it seems that even in the powerful outflow, this uh, uh, effect uh, is, is really um, relevant. Um, so, gas, the effect, sorry, the, I don't know why this. So, uh, gas removal, uh, so the ejective move doesn't seem very effective in uh, quenching star formation. We can look now into the uh, starvation mode, and here the idea is that uh, the outflow may not be very effective in removing gas from the uh, host galaxy, and this is primarily because uh, if you think about it, uh, all the energy which is injected by the by the quasar driven winds into the galaxy, in the end, uh, uh, leave the galaxy along the uh, uh, path of least resistance, okay? And so it doesn't really couple with the dense gas in the galaxy, but it uh, escapes uh, typically for instance in the disk perpendicular to the disk. And but this energy is not lost; it goes into heating the halo, uh, the CG, the circumvolating medium of the galaxy. And by doing so, it heats the halo and prevents uh, cold accretion to the galaxy. And therefore, if you do so, you prevent uh, fresh gas from arriving at the galaxy. And these results, when the galaxy has used the viable gas for uh, star formation, 
resulting to a sort of delayed feedback as a, and therefore the, the galaxy, as I mentioned, dies as a consequence of, star, of starvation. Now, uh, obtaining a, a clear uh, uh, evidence of this uh, uh, delayed uh, mode associated with the halo heating by the alpha is difficult because uh, you will need to uh, detect these uh, hot halos in uh, uh, high ratio galaxies where most of this action is uh, expected to happen. And then you would need probably uh, in the X-rays, Athena, uh, one of the next generation X-ray missions. However, something can be done by exploiting the Snipes and Dovich effect. So if you have this hot halo, you expect uh, the SZ effect to be seen in the halo, along the line of sight of, uh, of, uh, quasar, of uh, halos heated by these quasars. And people have tried to do this by stacking data from CMB data along the line of sight of uh, thousands of quasars. And they have detected a, a significant signal, although this experiment is very difficult because you, uh, the beam of the CMB data put together also the emission associated with the galaxy, so it's a very complex deep blending uh, technique. Of course, even better would be to identify this hot halo in the SZ in individual galaxies, and this start to be feasible uh, in high redshift quasars with ALMA. There's been a few uh, detection at the level of three for sigma, and we have obtained one of them. But with a deeper integration with ALMA, we should be able to see actually that clear signature of the SZ associated with the heating of the halo of these galaxies in individual uh, quasars. Um, a way that we know that uh, um, can contribute to heating the halo is uh, uh, not simply through wide angle uh, outflow, but also through radio jets. And this has been known now for a, a long time. Uh, when you have uh, radio jets, it, it tends to heat the uh, halo in the galaxy. And the power injected by the radio jet is, is um, essentially compensates the cooling uh, seen in the X-rays. And so it, it seems as it is, it is indeed a significant cool, uh, heating effect that can prevent cooling onto or the galaxy, galactic medium onto the uh, host galaxy. The main question or open question has always been uh, whether this uh, directional heating can really heat the whole halo. But this, is, I think, has been solved by some recent fantastic X-ray data where by using some uh, edge detection technique, it has been seen that actually the uh, energy injected in one dimension through sound waves actually propagates across the entire halo and uh, can indeed uh, um, distribute the energy uh, injected by the radio jet across the entire halo. Okay, so also radio jet and, and uh, outflows can help in heat the halo and prevents the accretion of cold gas onto the galaxy. Now, uh, indication that these uh, starvation effect is effect is a dominant quenching in galaxies has been found by investigating oh sorry about this uh, about the investigation of the scandalicities why how does it is a powerful tool because if you think about how a galaxy evolved in the stellar mass stellar metallicity diagram as the galaxy evolve it increases it forms stars from uh, and increase the stellar mass. And of course, as a new star, new stellar generation of form increase the metallicity, but the increase in metallicity is not very strong because you keep having accretion of gas, of low metallicity gas from the, from the circumgalactic medium, and this dilutes the metallicity of the galaxy. But when you start this starvation process, you no longer have, uh, and you isolate the galaxy, at that point you no longer have the dilution effect by the incoming uh, gas from low metallicity gas from the intergalactic medium, and you essentially the galaxy the galaxy starts to um, the stellar metallicity starts to evolve as a closed box and so increases much more steeply. So, so if you have uh, the in this scenario, expect that the passive galaxies should have a stellar metallicity much higher than their star forming progenitors, and this is indeed what has been found by uh, several a uh, few recent uh, works that uh, local the stellar metallicity of local passive galaxies is significantly higher than the uh, stellar metallicity of the star forming progenitors at higher ratio. So confirming that uh, you may uh, galaxy must undergo a significant extended phase of starvation 
which is responsible for quenching their, uh, their uh, stomach activity. Uh, you may wonder whether uh, also um, self-formation efficiency has, eff has an effect. This uh, sort of was uh, an aspect that has been uh, was neglected un until a few years ago. People were assuming that were assuming that whenever you have a, a gas, you, this gas forms stars at the same with the same efficiency. But this we now know is no longer the case. Oh, oh sorry about this. Uh, oh gosh. So um, people have now investigated the star formation efficiency that it is the um, um, uh, rate at which uh, the uh, stars form gas, that is the star formation rate divided by the gas mass. And you see that uh, uh, this is, is investigated by of a student of mine where she has investigated uh, by using uh, one of the various techniques how is a function of uh, offset from the, the subformation offset from uh, uh, the main sequence, the gas fraction change and the star formation efficiency say, change. And as you see that as you galaxies, this is in beams of the stellar mass, as galaxies leave the main sequence, the gas content uh, decreases and we uh, have seen why this is primarily due to the effect of starvation that gas is being consumed by stars Self-formation, but also partly maybe because of gas ejection. But interestingly, also the self-formation efficiency it, it declines. So as you move away from the uh, away from the main sequence, gas fraction, gas content, and self-formation efficiency goes down hand in hand. And this is shown more clearly here, where you have the self-formation efficiency and uh, as function of gas uh, fraction where galaxies now, the distribution of galaxies color coded by offset from the main sequence. So here you have the galaxy on the main sequence and you see that as galaxies leave the main sequence, they decrease both in gas content and star formation efficiency. Uh, and these we know that is the same also at high redshift. This was has been uh, shown by various studies. This is the, again the offset from the main sequence the function, the gas fraction is function of offsets from the main sequence, and you see that it decreases uh, leaving the main sequence. And this is the inverse of the star formation efficiency, which is uh, the um, so called depletion uh, time scale, which increases uh, from uh, when you leave the main sequence, which means the star formation efficiency decreases when you leave the main sequence. So, uh, actually, so in the inter is, this is an observational result. So, uh, star formation efficiency also the uh, decreases when galaxies start quenching. And why is that? And also more importantly, can quasars also and AGNs contribute to this uh, uh, lowering of the subformation efficiency as galaxies get um, quenched? And uh, uh, the answer is uh, yes, uh, maybe uh, uh, at least in uh, uh, population, some populations of, ga of uh, galaxies hosting AGNs. This is uh, a recent result by a collaborator where we have been uh, using MUSE data on a sample of uh, nearby AGNs and some of these have radio jets. And uh, these are not really radio galaxies, they are weak radio jets. And you see this is a oxygen tree flux obtained with the MUSE instrument and again an optical integral field spectrograph at ESO. And these interest, so you see that the oxygen tree emission is uh, stronger in the direction of the radio jets, fine, this was known. But the new result is this, which is showing the oxygen tree velocity dispersion across the field. And you see that interestingly, the velocity dispersion of oxygen tree is not along the uh, radio jet, but perpendicular to the radio jet, in the, actually in the plane of the uh, host galaxy. So the, uh, and this is actually in line with the, um, uh, some hydrodynamical simulations where they essentially expect that as the jet uh, pushes into the interstellar medium of the galaxy, it uh, generates energy, release energy, which uh, start to uh, create uh, the hot gas, which expands perpendicular to the jets and start to uh, steer uh, and heat the gas surrounding the, 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 the jet. So, and of course, once you heat and uh, increase the turbulence of the, of the gas, this increase the, um, uh, decrease the subformation efficiency because it makes uh, more unlikely that the gas can collapse to form stars. So the, um, uh, 
uh, the radio jet can actually contribute to uh, low lowering the stuff of machine efficiency in the lost galaxy, or in, in addition to heating the circumgalactic medium and therefore contributing to starvation. So can uh, help to both, uh, to, can contribute to both effect. And uh, some other studies have investigated uh, in detail the uh, star formation efficiency in the circumnuclear region, region of galaxy with uh, faint radio jets, and have indeed found that with respect to the so-called schmidt kennecott relation, so the relationship between star formation rate and molecular gas, these uh, galactic uh, nuclei, these uh, galaxies with radio, weak radio jets do have a star formation efficiency, which is much lower than predicted by the schmidt kennecott law. However, uh, so low luminosity uh, AGNs uh, can lower the star formation efficiency in galaxies. But uh, if you go to uh, luminous AGNs and quasars, especially at higher redshift, there is an unexpected result that they behave orthogonally. So here is, uh, uh, and there are several works which find the same at, uh, in powerful quasars at a higher redshift. And uh, uh, this is taken from a recent work by Manuel Biscetti. Here, what you have is the gas fraction as a function of stellar mass. And what you see here is the uh, relationship it's seen for main galaxies, uh, star forming galaxies on the main sequence. And you see that uh, AGNs tend to be uh, powerful quasars and powerful AGNs tend to have a lower gas content than the main sequence gas. So it goes in the right direction that the AGN can help in lowering the gas fraction, either because of gas, gas ejection and more likely because of gas of starvation, okay? However, when you look at the star formation efficiency, okay, you see that uh, this is again the, the evolution of the star, for, of star formation efficiency for normal galaxies on the main sequence. You see that galaxies with a quasar actually have a much higher star formation efficiency than normal galaxies. And this is possible because it's exactly the opposite effect that you had seen earlier on for, uh, for normal gas. So why uh, gas with powerful quasar behave like that is not clear. Maybe there is uh, either they obey a different physics or maybe they have actually in these cases, you also have a component of positive feedback that boosts star formation when you have a quasar. And the next part of my, uh, presentation will be indeed about that. But before I go, jump in onto that, let me briefly summarize the key points to take home about galaxy quenching. So black hole mass in particular and the four in the, its phase of accretion dominates galaxy quenching, star formation quenching in galaxies. This applies for central galaxy and high mass satellite galaxies. So I, I didn't have time to discuss low mass satellites. And the mode through which the, the black hole quench galaxies is probably not primarily through uh, dejecting modes, uh, which can certainly eject gas out of the central region, we see that, but it's probably ineffective in shutting down submission across the entire galaxies. Uh, however, blot house flows and radio jets can heat the circumgalactic medium, the, ga the galaxy halo, therefore suppress uh, inflow of uh, fresh cold gas from the uh, circumgalactic medium, and this leads uh, to starvation of the galaxy, and therefore a delayed or what is sometimes called preventive feedback. However, this is also joined to reduction of star formation efficiency, and the radio jets uh, can be effective uh, in injecting uh, turbulence and heating in the galactic medium of the galaxy, in the ISM of the galaxy, and therefore reducing star formation efficiency. But the puzzling result is that powerful quasars seem to have the opposite effect. And the question is whether this is linked to some form of positive feedback. And this is the, uh, uh, essentially the second part of my talk, which will be shorter, don't worry. <laughs> that whether uh, some agent-driven outflow can actually um, foster uh, star formation rather than um, uh, quench star formation in galaxies. Now we know that there are two main uh, classical modes of star formation. One is the usual star formation in galactic disks. Then there is the uh, boosted star formation in um, starburst to induce probably by often by interaction and mergers. You may have also sometimes uh, uh, triggered star formation by jet uh, in, uh, induced by jets and outflow. And by this, I mean that uh, the ISM or the uh, circumgalactic medium is compressed by 
the jet or by the outflow, and this can trigger, uh, promote the, the star formation. And you have um, some very nice examples. This uh, Sene is one of the most beautiful, where you see the radio jet here. And on large scale, you see this chain of the individual stars, which are actually formed perpendicular, parallel to the jet, clearly by the compression by the uh, shock the gas by the jet. And here you have a cloud, which is actually uh, again compressed by the jet and uh, from stars. However, like these uh, cases of uh, compressed gas of, um, and uh, positive feedback are actually modest, typically of the order of uh, less than a solar mass per year. Okay, and typically much less. However, there is a, a possibly an even more uh, exotic mode of star formation. And to explain this, uh, I want to recall that. Uh, most galactic outflows have a large quantity of molecular gas. This is now seen essentially in all uh, galactic outflows, especially in those which are quasar driven or agent driven. This has been uh, detected through the P signal profiles uh, in the, for instance, OH or water lines in the far infrared, or through the detection of very broad wings associated with the uh, emission uh, molecular traits such as uh, CO and, and so on. And we have seen that these uh, molecular outflows correlate with star formation rate, the, the outflow rate correlates with star formation rate, and is also boosted by the presence of uh, an AGM. Interestingly, these, a large fraction of these molecular outflowing glass is very dense, with density uh, of 10 to the 6, 10 to the uh, uh, or 10 to the 5 uh, particle per cubic centimeter. So, and the fraction of dense gas in the outflow is actually typically larger than in the disk. This can be seen this in the case of Mercari 31, which is uh, the nearest uh, quasar. And this is the um, profile of the HCN, HCN line, which is a tracer of very dense gas. And you see that it has these very broad wings reaching velocities of uh, 1,000 km per second. And if you compare it with the distribution of CO, which is tracing more diffuse gas, you still have this, so this, see these uh, wings, but are much fainter compared to the core of the lines, which is the gas in the host gas. So you have actually more dense gas in the outflow than in the host gas. And the same is seen with the other transitions such as these excited transitions of water at high rate shift, where facing a very powerful outflows that uh, are uh, requires very high densities in, in, in the gas to be uh, excited, okay? So you have molecular gas, dense gas, and similar gas that you have in star forming regions, okay? In the outflow, but this is gas in the outflow, okay? Uh, other indications that you have very dense gas in the outflow comes uh, recently from the uh, tracing of the ionized components where by using, for instance, the sulfur doublet, you trace that the gas in the outflow is always more dense than the gas in the disk of the host galaxy. And this is probably a consequence of gas compression, of the flowing gas being compressed, okay? Uh, and not only is it is more dense, but it's also very clumpy. This is a fantastic uh, uh, map with ARM obtained with the, of the nearby galaxy NGC 4945, where you see that the molecular gas has clumps which have uh, uh, sizes of a few, only a few parsecs, and uh, masses of about 10 to the 5 uh, solar masses and uh, very dense. And interestingly, they have a Vera parameter which is uh, close to unity, which means that these clouds are likely self gravitating. Okay. And also, there is these other results again, which uh, from Kodaji Gon, who um, investigated the, um, uh, the structure of uh, the high velocity uh, gas in HCN and finding that at high resolution, actually, most of this gas is not distributed uniformly but in the very tiny clumps uh, of, with very low velocity dispersion. So most of the gas in this outflow is uh, um, uh, molecular, very dense and clumpy, which is exactly the condition that you have in star forming regions and in the bulk of star bursting uh, nuclei, okay? So the physical conditions are the same, are the same as you expect in, 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 uh, in uh, star forming, uh, dense star forming regions. So, can actually start forming inside the galactic outflows, okay? And keep in mind that this start kind of potential star formation is very different from the star formation that I mentioned earlier on, for instance, for a CNA, where the, you have compression of uh, uh, gas in the disk or in the secret galactic medium, uh, because in that case, uh, 
you have a, a local gas which is being compressed and forms stars. In this case, you have gas in the uh, with high velocity that can form stars at this kind of high velocity. The dynamics of the resulting stars will be completely different. So if uh, uh, indeed there, there have been a number of uh, models uh, and uh, simulations recently where to which they predict uh, that uh, the flow molecular uh, clouds can undergo compression and fragmentation and uh, resulting in gravitational collapse. And so you can have stars forming in the outflowing molecular clouds. And uh, uh, some of these models predict that uh, this uh, uh, star formation rate in study alpha can be really a uh, major of the order even of uh, hundreds of solar mass per year in the uh, extreme star uh, outflows in the early universe. Uh, the important thing is that if you form stars in these outflowing molecular clouds, then the once stars forms, they retain the kinematic imprint of the flowing molecular clouds out of which they were born of out and uh, uh, therefore they once they form of course they at this point they only respond to gravity and they either escape the galaxy if they have enough high velocity or they start to uh, uh, oscillate around the galactic center with highly radar uh, orbits and this has major potential implication because can you understand can contribute to the formation of this radar component of galaxies either the bulge or the halo uh, of, the, of the gas, or even entire uh, elliptical galaxies. Is there observational evidence for this information inside outflows? We had obtained the first evidence in this uh, um, galaxy, which, had a very, which has a very powerful outflow with driven by an AGN, in, uh, traced by high velocity of uh, various nebular emission lines. This is a map again with news with the uh, velocity. The, this is the approaching part of the alpha, the receding and with very high velocity dispersion. And when you uh, locate the flowing gas on the so-called BPT diagrams, again, in honor of uh, uh, Roberto here, in Roberto T <laughs> in the audience, uh, you see that uh, most of the gas, uh, yeah, flowing gas, is actually diagnosed, which is uh, consistent with beam star forming. And we have extended this diagnosis with other traces in the infrared, which unambiguously say that actually the flowing gas is typical of, uh, of star forming regions, but again in the in the outflow, not in the disk. Okay, and uh, the resulting star formation rate in the outflow is about uh, fifteen to thirty solar masses per year, and the, the uh, most of the stars forming the outflow are expected to be gravitationally bound, so they will end up being part of the bulge or or the halo. Okay. We have extended this kind of analysis uh, to uh, a large sample of uh, galaxies from, again, the Manga survey, again, investigating the velocity of uh, different components of the uh, nebular lines, identifying uh, outflows with high velocities. And again, we find that uh, out of the sample of about uh, um, 30 outflows identified in Manga, one third of them have diagnostics in the outflow consistent with star formation. So consistent with star formation in the outflow. Of course, you may say, okay, this outflowing gas is consistent with star formation diagnostics, but uh, uh, this doesn't necessarily mean that you have stars forming in the outflow. It could be that you have the outflowing gas, which is illuminated by this radiation field of the stars in the disk. Well, you can distinguish between these two scenarios by using the ionization parameter, because the ionization parameter is uh, sensitive to the inverse of the distance of the uh, radiation source and also of the density, of the square of the distance, okay? And so in this case, you would expect that the ionization parameter is much lower than in the case, than the star forming regions in typical uh, uh, disk galaxies. Well, in this case, you would expect this uh, ionization parameter to be similar to what you have in the star forming region in the, in the disk. And here, what you have here is in grayscale is the distribution of ionization parameters traced by the oxygen tree of the oxygen tree line as a function uh, of uh, this R233 uh, parameter, which is a trace of metallicity. And again, if you were well, in this scenario, you would expect that the ionization parameter of uh, the gas in the outflow would be orders of magnitude below this, uh, what's seen in the normal star forming regions. And instead you see that uh, the star formation in the, the gas in the outflow 
has the same uh, ionization parameters in the outflow, and if anything, it's actually a slightly higher. So it's totally consistent with this scenario, not with this one. Okay. Uh, just to mention that, of course, the star formation rate in this uh, is inferred for this outflow is relatively modest. However, we have inferred that there is a correlation between star formation rate in the outflow and star formation and the, and the ionized outflow rate. So, if you extrapolate this correlation to the very high outflow rates seen in the early universe at high redshift, then you may expect that the resulting, uh, if the, the same correlation applies at higher ratio, the, the resulting star formation rate inside the outflow can be actually on the orders of a few tens or even uh, uh, hundreds of solar masses uh, per uh, uh, year as uh, expected by some uh, models. And I think there are already uh, evidences in existing data, it's simply that people may have not analyzed the data uh, actually in uh, with this uh, perspective in mind. Okay, there is a lot of preconception in the way we sometimes we interpret the, the, the data. Um, you may wonder, okay, if you if this uh, star formation inside alpha is uh, is so common, why has not been identified earlier? Well, the main problem is that uh, most of these uh, galactic outflows are uh, the most prominent ones are driven by AGNs. And once you have the uh, um, ionization by the AGN, even if you have a lot of star formation in the outflow, the diagnostics are totally dominated by the uh, photoionization effect of the AGN. This is because the uh, um, photoionization yield of the AGN is so much superior with respect to the stars that it drifts uh, any diagnostics toward the agent. So even if you have a lot of star formation in the alpha, even the presence of a, a, an even weak uh, an AGN would drift the, all the diagnostics toward the agent region. So it's very difficult to identify this kind of uh, effect. You need uh, spatially resolved broadband spectroscopy to uh, identify this kind of star formation inside outflows. Okay. And the corollary of this is that the problem is the, the fraction of uh, outflows which host formation is higher than we have estimated. Uh, it would be nice anyhow to trace directly the uh, young stars forming in the, uh, in the outflow, not simply through nebular diagnostics. And we have tried to do that by using uh, um, UV HST uh, spectroscopy uh, with COS, which is uh, uh, sensitive to, uh, to uh, several features in the UV part of the spectrum. And one of these features is this uh, uh, C3 line. Uh, there are several other features which are mostly uh, all uh, ISM, associated with the ISM. But this feature is, only photos is one of the few photos pure photospheric feature only for the in the uh, UV spectrum of galaxies. So tracing the essential the velocity of uh, the youngster population in, in galaxies. And you see that uh, in this uh, galaxy, which has an outflow, the C3 line is actually blue shifted by a few hundred kilometers per second. Okay, so it does is exactly what you expect from stars which have formed inside the outflow. This is another case again, Marcari 31. This is the cost spectrum. Uh, this was published by VA a few years ago and was deemed as the featureless spectrum in terms of stellar features. But mostly it was because the few features that it he had identified where blue shifted, so he thought there were, couldn't be associated with, with, with stars. But if you now think in the, uh, this new scenario that you can have uh, of flowing uh, young stars, you see now that this feature again, the C3, is exactly uh, uh, identifiable as a stellar feature in blue shifted again by a few hundred kilometers per second, which is about the same velocity that you have in the flow uh, of these. Um, of this galaxy, of this quasar, okay? And if you put together the, uh, this uh, work by Federica Loyacon, she's uh, combined together the results from uh, various, uh, uh, about 70 cost spectra. And you see that in most, uh, the, the, on average, you have that the C3 line is actually tracing the OB stars, is blue shifted in galaxies with respect to the rest frame. So mo in most of these outflows, there is some um, form of uh, um, stars forming in the outflows. And you see that uh, uh, some of these are uh, very blue shifted of, with the velocity exceeding 1,100 kilometers per second. Uh, of course, the applications are major in the sense that uh, this is uh, from a model, the 
the is showing the radial velocities of the stars from the office as a function of distance from the galactic center. You may have galaxies which escape the galaxy and therefore go into the intracluster light, uh, forming into a, but uh, a fraction of the, uh, the stars actually can remain bound and contribute to forming the bulge of the galaxy or the halo of the, of the galaxy. And there's been some more, uh, these, uh, these kind of scenarios gained momentum. Uh, there's been now even uh, uh, people doing uh, hydrodynamical cosmological simulation are looking to this. And this is a recent paper by the FIRE uh, group uh, where they uh, actually incorporate this potential mechanism in their simulation. They actually obtained that uh, a fraction of, a large fraction of the galaxy, of the stars in the halo actually are probably born in situ in the, uh, during the outflowing events of the main galaxy, okay? And this is uh, in one of these, uh, the snapshots of this simulation where these stars are formed in the, in the, in the, in the outflow. And they investigate that uh, what fraction of the galaxies in the uh, uh, halo can actually be born in, uh, in, the, in, the, in this uh, outflow event and depends a lot on the specific uh, uh, simulation, but it can reach uh, close to 100% of the, of the stars in the halo. Or you may say, okay, if this is, uh, you have such a large fraction of uh, stars for in the halo formed in uh, uh, outflows, how it happens that in our own Milky Way, we don't see these uh, stars with very high uh, radial velocity forming these past uh, outflowing outflows in the, in the center of the, uh, generated by the center of the Milky Way. But the point is that we do, okay? There's been this fantastic paper of Vasily Bulokurevo, <laughs> I never pronounce his name, uh, and um, which uh, they have used the second Gaia data release. And what you see here is the azimuthal velocity of the stars in the, uh, I think the five kiloparsecs around our solar neighborhood as a function of age of the stars, okay? And here you see the stars that are rotating, which are associated with a thick and a thin disk. And here you see this population of all stars, which have essentially predominantly radial, a lot of, uh, of the stars which have predominantly these radial orbits. They interpret this in their paper primarily as an effect of an old event of another galaxy colliding heads on with the Milky Way and so resulting in this very radio velocity. But the leaving aside that these heads on collision are probably rare because you would need the galaxy to collide with the Milky Way without any angular momentum. Uh, this is uh, um, actually what you would expect from models of stars which have formed in a galactic outflow. Indeed, the first, uh, sorry that this, there is these uh, labels here. Um, uh, the first uh, uh, models of uh, predicting star formation in our flow predicted by Zubovas in 2013, it did predict uh, the existence of galaxies in, uh, in the halo that should have uh, a very highly radial orbits and higher metallicity with respect to the rest of the population of the halo stars. And I forgot to mention here that this is a sample of gas which have uh, very high metallicity with respect to the halo star. So these stars which have been discovered by Gaia, which are a lot, a large fraction of the galaxy in the halo, actually respond exactly to the prediction of stars formed in the, in the outflows, okay? Uh, let me just finish by mentioning that the implication of this uh, star formation mode inside outflows is, uh, there are several. In addition to contribute to the formation of this spheroidal component of galaxies, they can, pre, for instance, contribute to the black hole sigma relation. Indeed, you know that the black hole mass and the velocity expression of the uh, bulge correlate very tightly. And there has been a lot of model uh, uh, invoking complex feedback mechanism to link these two quantities, okay? But if you think now in the scenario of stars forming in the outflow, this can be uh, explained very easily without invoking any uh, complex scenario because what is found empirically is that the outflow velocity of uh, AGN-driven winds correlate with AGN luminosity with a power law of 4.5, okay? Now, if you assume that uh, the AGN luminosity, essentially uh, the bulk of uh, uh, 
uh, AGNs are created at the sum fraction of the um, editor ratio, this essentially translates into black hole mass. And the outflow velocity, once it's essentially realized, essentially translates into uh, velocity expression. So this uh, relationship in terms of outflow directly translates into the black hole sigma, which has exactly a power of 4.5 as we see in the outflow. So it just gives you this without having to invoke any evol strange evolutionary mechanism, okay? So summary, sorry that it took a little bit longer, uh, of the second part, star formation inside gas flow expected by mod, uh, are expected by models and cosmological simulations. The uh, star, formation rate, uh, star formation inside gas clouds is now unambiguously observed. And uh, they, they can have uh, a major potential implication for galaxy evolution. And uh, keep in mind that we have just started to scratch the surface of this new mode of star formation. And so give it time to new observation to actually explore this further. And I think it can explain, explain a lot of galactic properties if you give it uh, uh, time to explore these uh, mechanisms more thoroughly with observation and simulations. And I am finished and thank you. Thank you very much, Roberto, for the interesting talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. Ah, perfect. I see Rosa. Uh, Rosa, go ahead. Hi. Hi, very nice talk. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, Roberto, if uh, the star formation in the outflows could contribute at least a little bit to the correlation between black hole mass and globular cluster number. Uh, this uh, could be, I don't know, is... Uh, I mean, you would I, need... I, very... I, never thought, I never thought about that. Uh, yeah, you would, you would need a very high star formation rate, but these things are... Uh, in the halo have a very tight correlation, just like sigma, mm -hmm. and they are halo objects with radial velocities. Um, could be. I mean, uh, the investigating how star formation proceeds in this outflow is still at the, how to say, at the early phases in terms of observational constraints. So uh, the, 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 what we know observationally is uh, essentially these uh, integrated velocities and uh, some uh, of these diagnosis diagrams. We don't know much a lot yet. Uh, what a way forward to investigate this is through, through this cosmological simulation and see whether, for instance, these uh, uh, flowing uh, uh, star, uh, star forming star, uh, clouds actually, for instance, can result into a global cluster, for instance. I don't know this. Uh, this probably is some. I doubt that the current simulations have the resolution to actually simulate the formation of global plastic, but maybe in the, in the coming years, this could be a possibility. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Rosa. Do we have any other questions? I have a question. Have a question. Oh, please go ahead. I have a question. Uh, yeah, please go ahead, Roberto. Uh, Roberto, nice talk. I was wondering, um, what's the situation with the information that comes from broad absorption line QSOs? Have huge um, and a high velocity uh, ejecta seen in carbon four basically profiles and other lines. And um, um, it seems to me, if you're talking about uh, uh, um, galactic winds or a large amount of mass ejected from galaxies, um, these are probably the most extreme cases known. Uh, how they fit into, into the present skin, the bulk USOs? Yeah, okay. The, but the part that we see in the UV typically is the um, mostly ionized component uh, of, of the outflow. So maybe this is not the part that uh, can uh, participate in the star formation, but we know that for instance, in the low bar, there is a low ionization component, which is gas which is close to neutral. So there is a, a flag, and of course, uh, keep in mind the more, uh, um, uh, that all of these studies of bulk quasars depends on uh, uh, 
selection effects and how we, the viewing angle and so on. But the interesting thing is that uh, uh, re studies which have investigated in details uh, the, um, some of the outflow which can uh, uh, explore the in, uh, in great details in terms of shape of the lines and depth and with multiple transition have found that uh, the outflowing gas is very clumpy. This is based on the effect of uh, uh, flat top, the uh, flat bo bottom, um, um, uh, flat bottom of the some of the lines and the line the absorption line ratios, which uh, indicates that the, the coiling factor is actually not unity but actually is, is relatively small. And from that you can infer the, the uh, that the gas, the flowing gas, is very clumpy. And this goes exactly in the same direction that I was saying that. Uh, these the, the bars also confirm that the flowing gas is highly clumpy, and this is uh, what you expect again for gas which uh, should be um, fragmented and uh, going towards gravitational collapse. So it's uh, of course per se doesn't uh, necessarily mean that, but goes in the same direction essentially. So from my perspective, it's. Uh, uh, confirming this potential scenario. The best would be to, for the, uh, and there are studies going that to, for the same bar quasars to investigate the same effect in, um, in, molecular, in the molecular phase to see whether you see the same kind of uh, absorption. Uh, there are uh, now a number of cases where this has been detected, but uh, the, the problem is that in the case of uh, quasars, we tend to see a, by selection effect, a cleaned angle, a viewing angle, where we, since we see them unreddened and uh, it's been selected general to color selection, we tend to see the lighter side of the quasar, which essentially has been cleaned by most of the gas. So by, se by selection effects, you tend not to see the, the most interesting part of the outflowing absorption. Thank you, Roberto. Thanks, Roberto. We have uh, one question from uh, Vero. Uh, hi, I really enjoyed your talk. And uh, as a matter of fact, we're working in something very similar to that in the sense that um, we're using TNG 50, or where we intend to use TNG 50 mm -hmm. uh, to study the regions of star formations. Uh, exactly what you were saying um, that, that uh, I mean, star formation triggered by outflows. Mm -hmm. But what we want to, to investigate is um, these regions that are um, gravitationally bound to see if there could be a mechanism to form dwarf galaxies without dark matter in like in the sense of uh, TDGs, like the tidal dwarfs. So mm -hmm. this kind of dwarf galaxies without <clears throat> dark matter. So it was really interesting to me because we're doing well, that right now. That's a nice idea. I uh, didn't even yeah. think about that. So uh, that would be a very nice implication. So looking forward yeah. to see what, uh, what you find, yeah? Yeah, so I will, I mean, if you allow me, I would like to be in touch with you and to Absolutely. just to have some feedback about Absolutely. it. I'm very glad. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed your talk, thank you. Sure. Rivero, you should also look if you can form globular clusters. Yeah. <laughs> the thing is that we don't have the resolution for yeah, globular okay. clusters okay. in that, in that uh, uh, with the TNG 50. But yes, for, for dwarf galaxy, that's why. Okay. But it would be great to do so, some, some in simulation of TNG 50 to, to work, uh, for, uh, to manage to get the resolution for maybe not global clusters, but uh, something smaller, let's say. I should mention that in the, those simulations that I showed, I think are very, uh, relatively high resolution. I think even higher, so you need this kind of very detailed. Yeah, know. it's fire, right? Yeah, fire two. Yeah. The thing is that also with those, the <clears throat> the star formation threshold is very different. For yeah. example, in fire and in TNG fifty. That's why I think it's very interesting to uh, to look for these star formation regions where you can see what is the effect of uh, you know this clustering of uh, well, let's say we could find these uh, bigger zones of star formation that are gravitational gravitationally bound. What is the influence of this threshold? Because it's, it's of main importance. So, I mean, 
Yeah, yeah I, it's, uh, I, it's, uh, I, the, the main thing is that many of the simulations simply, I, I know some of my simulation colleagues, simply they, uh, there is a preconception of, of them sometimes because they say that the gas, the star should form in the disk. And when they see the condition outside the disk, they essentially switch it off, which is a sort of an artificial way. Uh, yes. To, to not, so it's, um, uh, it's, one has to revise uh, somehow the simulations and uh, how the subformation recipes are implemented in each of them. Yes. In many cases, they are essentially preventing that because it was thought to deemed to be a uh, sort of an unacceptable mode and therefore is uh, artificially suppressed. Yes, for example, there is this big difference with the uh, small galaxies or dwarf galaxies where you can form cores or you cannot form cores in the dark matter profile. And it's only dependent on this uh, threshold. So yeah. it's really, really important to put some constraints of observationally for these simulations because we're like uh, reaching that resolution of uh, subgrade physics, so yeah, great. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Vero and Rosa as well. Uh, so uh, let us uh, thank Roberto again. Thank you.